All right, so I'm going to get us started. And it's good to see everybody. And um, I have you muted. And uh, as you, uh, I'm sure, know at, that at this point, um, all you got to do is hit the space bar to unmute yourself. So it's, it's, it's very easy uh, if you want to, to go ahead and, and interject a comment. Um, I'm going to start a new lecture series with you today. And um, I believe I've, I've, I've mentioned to you for a while that I would be doing that. There's been so much happening in the news and the world with the election that uh, it's taken me a while to actually get this started. But I do want to get this started. And I, I think you will see that what I have to speak with you about today, I consider to be highly relevant both to um, contemporary American politics, but also to the overall justice of our society. The topic for this lecture series will be race and justice in America in the 21st century. And we're going to take some historical, critical, and ethical perspectives on that topic. Uh, and I just want to be clear with you, there will be other things happening in the world, obviously, uh, while this uh, lecture series transpires. And so I will, I promise you, uh, take time out of the lecture series to talk about what is happening in the world right now. And, and I am going to do that right now. Uh, and and so uh, I'm, I'm going to give you a historical overview of race and racism in America uh, in the lecture series today. But before I do that, I want to start by noting what's happening on the West Coast. And obviously, there's so much happening in the news. I could be talking with you about the recordings that Bob Woodward made of President Trump acknowledging that the virus is in fact worse than he publicly uh, indicated in a variety of statements uh, from February through the present, or his comments uh, on the military, at least as they've been reported in the Atlantic Magazine, things that have roiled the campaign. I will just point out briefly that um, the fundamental dynamic in the campaign appears to me to be unaltered by the developments of the recent week, which is to say, on the one hand, President Trump is still trailing Joe Biden nationally quite dramatically, a way that no incumbent really has ever in post-war American politics. And also, it appears trailing him in the swing states in which the election will be decided, although um, the margin there is much closer. This is not a done deal, but I think the people who have the most complex ways of understanding it indicate that there's about a three and four chance that Joe Biden will win the election if nothing fundamental upends the dynamic and the developments of the last week have reinforced rather than upending the dynamic. But where I want to start this week is not with the election, but with what's happening on the west coast of the United States. And you may have seen uh, today 500,000 people in Oregon were told to evacuate, including in major cities in the Portland suburbs. This means now that between one in 10 and one in five Oregonians have been told to evacuate, right? Between 10 and 20% of the population of an entire state has been told that they have to leave their homes. And the image I'm showing to you is why. This is Phoenix, Oregon. That was a trailer park. There's nothing left of it. Right. And, and, and so what we are seeing on the West Coast of the United States today, this is an enhanced satellite image, is unprecedented fire catastrophe. Right. And as you can see, there are major fires burning up and down the West Coast, cons consuming millions of acres probably upwards of 10 million 
acres of forest, but also of homes. And, and so you can obviously see multiple uncontained fires in California, multiple uncontained fires in Oregon, not quite as bad in Washington, also in Arizona, also in Colorado. And, and, and so the West Coast is on fire. And by the way, uh, so is much of South America. This is not as much in the news. Again, this is another satellite enhanced image. These images make it worse, look worse than it is. And it's not literally the case that the entirety of California is engulfed in flames, uh, but the glow of the fire indicates the spread of the smoke and the possibility for the spread of the fire, right? And, and, and so to be clear, as I've already said, we have not seen anything like this in American history. Uh, there were some bad fires at the beginning of the 20th century that killed a lot of people, but, but the degree to which the uh, entirety of um, the Americas is experiencing what are called mega fires, fires that burn a million acres or more is absolutely unprecedented in our history. I don't think we find events like this based on the archeological record in the last 10,000 years. So, so what has happened? And I, I, I want to be clear, this is climate change in action. I've given you lectures on this before. Um, and that in California, in the West Coast, in much of South America, we have the intersection of multiple climate crises at the same time. On the one hand, droughts. And these droughts are going back now in areas in South America for a decade, in areas in the West Coast for several years. Uh, that is combined with um, a tremendous heat wave that, as you probably know, set a uh, planetary temperature record in Death Valley uh, last month. 130 degrees has shattered temperature records in many hot places in Arizona and Southern California in South America as well. So you've got drought, you've got a heat wave. You then also have unprecedented um, weather events. And, and so many of these fires in California, particularly in Northern California, in the Santa Cruz area and the Mendocino coast were caused by lightning storms, dry lightning. That's a, a weather event if you've spent time in Chicago in the summer you're familiar with, but it's not a weather event that typically occurs on the West Coast, right? And, and, and so the climatic conditions have changed and we're getting new weather patterns and the combination of a drought, a heat wave, lightning, dry lightning um, has created this new crisis. Uh, and and I, I just want to point out, I do think this is a harbinger of things to come. We have fundamentally altered the climate of the planet Earth, and we are now beginning to cope with the consequences. And by the way, the people who were writing about this two, three years ago, I've given you lectures on this, indicated that this was coming. So this is not a surprise. This is exactly what science predicts will happen as we alter the Earth's atmosphere and climate. Now, the next issue with this is, is, is this is going to contribute to a self-reinforcing cycle. What's happening right now in California, Oregon, Washington, Arizona, Colorado, South America has two dimensions to it. On the one hand, millions of acres of forest are being burned. And as we know, trees are the most efficient carbon dioxide sink on the planet. That is to say, they pull 
heat trapping gas out of the atmosphere. Remember, this was originally called the greenhouse effect. And a greenhouse works by creating glass that allows the heat of the sun to come in, but then keeps it from escaping. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere does the same thing. The heat of the sun enters our atmosphere. Typically, around 40% of that heat would be radiated back out into outer space. With higher levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, less of the sun's energy escapes back out into the solar system. More of it stays as energy and heat in our atmosphere, in our ecosystems. And, and so um, the fact that trees are being destroyed is going to remove the capacity of the forests to take the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. At the same time, as I'm sure you're aware, burning large fires puts carbon dioxide out into the atmosphere. And by the way, I'm sure you're seeing the air quality in the west coast of the United States, but going all the way to the Midwest, right? The, the, the uh, airborne particulates, uh, the smoke, the ash, the silt is very dangerous. When homes burn, they of course contain plastics and chemicals. And so it's not just smoke, there's actually dangerous levels of toxic chemicals in the air. And so people are being advised to not go outside in many places in the West Coast right now. But of course, we've got a virus upon us as well, a major heat wave and people being displaced from their homes. This is truly awful. Having said all that, we can expect that the outcome of this is that it will in fact cause more climate change. More carbon dioxide is being spewed into the atmosphere. Trees that would eat it up are being destroyed, consumed by the fire. And so again, science has long warned us about the possibility of self-reinforcing cycles. We are seeing one on the west coast of North America and South America right now. Finally, the warning that has become increasingly dire is that climate change may test the capacity of government and civilization to cope. Most people who study this believe that climate change is now inevitable. The severity of it depends on how quickly we take action, but it can no longer be prevented or forestalled. Part of the issue is whether or not we are going to be able to cope with it. And what we're seeing in the West Coast right now is that it's overwhelming the capacity of government to, in the first instance, fight the fires. They're just too many, too intense, too widespread. You may have seen that they're bringing in firefighters from Australia and Israel because they lack the capacity to fight the fires using our own infrastructure and resources. And at the same time, when you have 10% of the population of Oregon under evacuation orders, where are those people going to go, right? This is um, really straining our capacity to cope. And I'm sorry to say, but this is an indication of things to come, right? We are in the midst of a global pandemic that is disrupting civilization as we know it. Uh, disrupting life as we know it, right? We can't go to the movies, we can't go to the mall, we can't see our family and friends at points. This is what climate change is going to do to us. And unlike the coronavirus, we can at least hope that there will be a vaccine in the next year. With climate change, there's no vaccine, there's no silver bullet, there's no easy way to
contain its consequences. It will be with us for the long term. All right, I'm, I'm going to stop just for a moment. As I said, I will be not only talking with you over the next few weeks about the issues of race and justice in America, but what's in the news. That was my effort to talk about one thing in the news this week. I'll take questions before I move into the heart of today's lecture. Does anybody have a question or a comment they want to raise about the fires or climate change? Want to talk? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay, I have a question, uh, David. Yes, is there, please. Is there anything that we are doing that is causing all this uh, spontaneous fire, or is that just a force of nature? Well, my my claim, and I, I believe this is the valid science on this, is that we created the conditions that unleashed these forces of nature. And um, I could talk about mismanagement of the forests, right? That's a, a century old problem in the United States that, that we have put out fires too quickly. But what I'm really talking about is climate change. And um, so the reason that it's so hot in so much of um, the Western Hemisphere right now, so hot on the West Coast of the United States, South America as well, is because of climate change. And so does climate change cause the fires? Um, that's a little tricky to, to argue. One of the big fires apparently was caused by somebody setting off fireworks to announce the gender of their baby, right? Or the, the sex of their baby. You know, uh, that's the, what you might call proximate or immediate cause. But the reason what might have been a little fire turned into a conflagration, right? You know, it consumed hundreds of thousands or millions of acres is because there was such a long standing drought because there was such a bad hot spell uh, heat wave in that region of the country. And that's caused by climate change. So no, these are not natural events. Climate change is not a natural process. This is a man-made event. We have for two centuries now burned coal and petroleum and increased our agricultural productivity. And in so doing, we have put more and more heat trapping gases out into the environment. And the consequence is that the planet is hotter and it's getting increasingly hotter. And we're going to see increasing catastrophes that look like natural catastrophes, that look like droughts, that look like fires, that look like famines, that look like the displacement of human beings by these events, but that in fact we have created the conditions that make these events happen. Now, if we had, if our government had recognized climate changes uh, and not ignored the warnings, would that have made a big difference? Uh, abso absolutely. Yeah, and, 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 and so I've been reading about this. The, the first testimony in front of Congress about the risk of climate change occurs in 1957, right? And in 1957, a government scientist is warning Congress that if our rate of carbon emissions continues, we may make California and Texas uninhabitable, right? Um, that's 1957. That's uh, more than 60 years ago. Uh, we still are not taking action, right? Please remember that Donald Trump withdrew the United States from the Paris Climate Accords. Now, the one qualification I, I would have here, and, and speaking of Paris uh, puts us in mind of this, uh, is that um, 
This is a global phenomenon. The United States by itself cannot solve this problem. And, and I'll just say a little bit of something more here for a moment, which is that, that some people speak of the earth as having a global ecosystem, what's sometimes called the Gaia sphere, Gaia, the, the Greek god of, of the planet earth, right? That there's an entire interactive ecosystem for the planet as a whole. That's a controversial hypothesis, but what it does point out is that there's an interconnectivity for the planet as a whole. So if Brazil continues to burn its rainforest, if China continues to build coal-powered coal energy plants and to move over to mass gas-based automobile transportation, <laughs> the most aggressive action in the United States will not do anything. So the United States doesn't just need to address this domestically. We need to be in a leadership position in addressing this globally. And um, we were never uh, at the forefront of this, right? Under the Obama administration, we assumed a leadership position, but countries like Norway and Germany would have pushed us to go still further. But under the Trump administration, there's been tremendous backsliding on these issues. Uh, frankly, climate denialism, right? Trump has said that climate change, he thinks is a Chinese hoax. And, and so, yes, we need to be doing things. No, we cannot do them on our own. And we have never done enough and we certainly didn't do it in a time frame that would have allowed us to avoid this. So we are playing a game of catch up now. It's not a game we want to be playing. It's not a game that's going to be pretty. It's going to be disastrous. What we're seeing on the West Coast right now, as I say, is an indication of what's coming. What we saw with Hurricane Laura is an indication of what's coming. It is going to get worse. And there are things we can do to mitigate it. There are things we can do to prepare it, prepare for it. There are things that we can do to not contribute to worsening it. I don't think there's anything we can do to prevent it at this point. Well, you answered my question. Thank All you. All right. Good. Anybody else with a question before I move into the main subject for the lecture? Yes. Uh, go. One minute. Harriet wants to ask you yeah. something. So Please, Harriet, go ahead. Would you say that the Industrial Revolution had all to do with this? Yes. <laughs> In short. So, so the question is, is it the Industrial Revolution, right? And, and uh, the, there are people who would argue we're in the middle of the third industrial revolution, right? And so the first industrial revolution is powered by coal and steam. The second industrial revolution is powered by uh, uh, com the internal combustion engine and electricity. Both of those phases in the industrial revolution um, are major contributors to the carbon levels in the atmosphere today. And, and that's why as early as the 1950s, scientists were warning us about this. Now, this continues to this day in Brazil and India and China. And um, we, uh, in a sense, in the United States, uh, have mainly moved on from this kind of infrastructure. Having said that, right, we still have coal-fired power plants, and, and obviously this has become a kind of culture war issue. Um, the evidence is very clear, and, and, and by the way, the industry understands the evidence and is moving away from coal power, even if it is a political wedge issue. But let me just say, right right now, um, I drive a Tesla. I, 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 I just got one. And you remember Jay Leno, the late night comedian. Yeah. I, I heard him say something the other day 
which is that Elon Musk, who's the man who directs the Tesla company, is the Henry Ford of the 21st century. The 20th century was the century of gas. The 21st century will be the century of electricity. And, and I heard him say that, and then I'm out driving an electric vehicle. By the way, if you haven't been in one, they're, they're, they're wonderful. They're, they're really uh, very fun to drive, and their technology is, is, is fantastic. But having said that, I'm, I'm driving a vehicle that uh, doesn't have any emissions, right? And I'm sitting there on the freeway and every car around me is a gas powered car. And I'm thinking to myself, I wonder if this is what it felt like to be uh, in an automobile when you were surrounded by horse drawn buggies, right? So there is technology, 21st century technology that does address this. The problem is it can't be adapted quickly enough. We need to move over to alternative sources of energy. We need to move over to electric powered vehicles. We need to move over to kinds of architecture and uh, the construction of our lifestyle that um, does not uh, require the intensive investment of, of carbon, whether that's agriculture mm -hmm. or higher density living or electric-based transportation, there, the technology <laughs> exists. One of the integral questions here is going to be the rate of adoption. How quickly do we get the technology that could address our problems online? Now I have another comment, Megan. Go ahead. Now that, now that we know what the problem is in the future, in the election coming up, does the the Democratic Party have any platform on this? Yes. We know, they, what, we know what Trump says, but do we know what has Biden, the Democratic Party, addressed this issue? And, and so you may remember that um, the um, Democratic National Convention, the nominating convention occurred as these fires in California were just getting started. And in his acceptance speech, Joe Biden said, we are facing four crises right now. I was actually surprised that he said that, right? We're, we're facing the pandemic. We're facing its economic consequences. We're facing a reckoning on issues of racial justice, which is where I'm, I'm going to speak with you today about, but we're also facing a climate change crisis. And so yes, Biden put climate change in the spotlight at the nominating convention in a way that it never has been before. And his platform involves rejoining the Paris Climate Accords and having something like what's called a Green New Deal, which is to say major infrastructure investment in order to both create jobs in the middle of a pandemic caused recession and to change the energy infrastructure of the United States to make it more environmentally sound. Now, you may have seen Donald Trump a, a, a few days ago said that he's an environmentalist. Um, it's, it, 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 yes, it, it, it almost doesn't bear comment, right? I, I guess there's a question about what won't he say um, if he thinks it's to his political advantage. But he did in fact say that the other day, maybe slowly but surely the Republican Party will change its tune on this because if, if, if you look at that map of the West Coast of the United States, you know, Eastern Oregon is solidly Republican and Montana and Wyoming have fires and tremendous smoke coverage as well. Texas got damaged by Hurricane Laura, right? Environmental change, climate change, is not uh, partisan in its effects. It's going to affect all of us. And so maybe the Republicans will slowly become more responsive to it. All right, so unless there are any other questions, I'm going to get uh, back to the main topic of today's lecture.
Uh, and um, you want me to get the uh, slides back up for you. And, and I'm just going to give you a, a brief overview of the lecture series. Um, I have five weeks outlined here. I'm not sure that it will actually uh, go precisely as planned because I will pause to update you on what's happening in the election and the news cycle as I just did. And we've used basically half of today's lecture on climate change. That's fine, that's good, that's what we should do. But the result is that this may take a little bit longer. But what I'd like to do is give you a historical overview of race and racism in America today, then talk um, next week uh, uh, about the color of law and the unsteady march of freedom struggles. And, and, and so one of the key claims that I think the recent literature on racial inequality in the United States makes quite persuasively is that in the 20th century, over especially the last 50 to 70 years, it's the law that has been primary in generating racial inequality, especially wealth inequality, and that although we've had a major civil rights movement in this country in the 1950s and 1960s, although we may be at the dawn of another important civil rights movement, we'll have to wait and see, those movements have not had the success we sometimes like to think they've had in uh, addressing especially wealth inequality, but inequality in general in terms of race. In week three, I will then talk about more generally how important race is to overall social order in the 21st century in the United States and use the most current social science to talk about um, both the lived experience of race, what we understand about the psychology of race, um, and some of the forces that make racial order so stubborn, so hard to address despite our best intentions. In the fifth week, I'll move beyond what I've been talking about in the first three weeks, which is primarily focusing on the division between uh, European or white Americans and African or black Americans, right? And, and try to look at it in a more complex way, bring Latinos and Asians into the picture as well as people who are multiracial and talk about the complexity of racial identity once you have multiple axes of racial differentiation. And then finally, I'll talk about ethics, justice, and the future of race in American democracy. So, so that's an overview of the lecture series I put together for you guys. Um, let me start um, with uh, a, a little bit of an indication of the literature I'm going to be drawing on. Um, some books, uh, George Fredrickson, a great historian at Stanford, has uh, a book I would recommend to you as being short and legible, uh, easily read, uh, Racism, A Short History. Howard Winant has a much longer and more systematic sociology of race called The World as a Ghetto, Race and Democracy Since World War II. As many of you are familiar, the New York Times Sunday Magazine did an a entire issue that's attracted a lot of attention the so-called 1619 project uh, for uh, 2019, right? It was the 400th anniversary of the first importation of African slaves to the uh, to North America, and um, this uh, article, these articles, this issue has gained a lot of attention, some controversy as well. And, and then another book, uh, Ibram Kendi's Stamped from the Beginning, The Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America, is, is the kind of material I'm going to be drawing on today and over the next couple of weeks. So uh, I'm, I'm going to start with a, a, a qualification. Um, and that is that I am obviously not African American. And um, I don't consider that to be a necessary qualification to talking uh, about this topic. Uh, 
but um, it does limit my first person experience with racial discrimination. And, and so I do want to point out, you know, I, I believe I have studied a lot about this topic. I believe I've thought a lot about this topic. I've done my best to be as empathic as possible, but there is an experiential dimension to this. There is um, an affective dimension to this that I simply lack. And, and, and so I want to be clear about that at the outset. I do not have to cope with the daily toll that racism, racial profiling, being viewed primarily through the lens of your race takes on people. And, and, and so I want to be clear about that. Um, and I'm going to give you uh, something of an overview of uh, racial inequality and justice issues in America today. Uh, and then try to define some terms for you and talk about how important race is in um, contemporary American society. All of that, of course, in 20 minutes. Um, but I, I, I want to start by noting why I'm, I'm talking with you about this right now. And that is because we are in the midst of a nationwide wave of protests about racial injustice, protests that were really catalyzed or prompted by the death of George Floyd at the hands of the Minneapolis police in May of this year, that gruesome video of the life being choked out of him over eight minutes. Um, and as you can see, the, the, the protests cover the United States almost like a case of measles, right? And the, the size of these protests, protests that are, uh, have 500,000 or more people in them in many parts of the country, right? In, in, in New Mexico, right? Uh, not just uh, in Boston or New York or Los Angeles, in Las Vegas as well, right? Protests with hundreds of thousands of people or 50,000 to 100,000. This is a sustained wave of uh, politics in the streets of a kind that we haven't seen since the 1960s. And, 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 and so um, this is part of what's prompting us to think about this right now, this moment of national reckoning. And of course, since George Floyd's death, there have been multiple further killings of African Americans at the hands of the police and additional attention being paid to these issues, most recently, of course, in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Um, this is the image, and, and I, in a sense, need to apologize, and in another sense, we need to look this in the face, right? Um, this is the image that, that got this all started. And I want to say to you, it is a powerfully brutal image. And for those of you who have the stomach to bear it, there's an eight minute long recording of this Minneapolis police officer with the knees on the neck of a man he has already handcuffed and detained. Uh, there's really no justification whatsoever for this treatment. I think that goes without saying. But I think at the same time, part of the reason, it's not just the brutality, it's not just the vivid directness of this, it's not just the immediacy of having a recording, it's also the way in which this image contains a map to the power relations, relations of domination and subordination that have been organized along racial lines in our country for 400 years and their persistence into the historical moment. I think, you know, one of the thought experiments to do here is if the police officer were black and 
the suspect were white, would this have ever occurred? Would the nonchalance of, of uh, Derek Chauvin having his hand in his pocket, looking straight into the camera, being unconcerned that He's being filmed while he's doing this. Could any of that have occurred if the racial roles were reversed? And I think the clear answer is absolutely not. This, in a sense, gets us to the heart of racism and racial order, racial subordination in the United States in 2020. If we had seen this as an image of the United States in the antebellum period, we would be unsurprised. We know that slavery was brutal. If we had seen this as an image of the Jim Crow South, we would have been unsurprised. We know that that was a hateful racist regime. But when we see it in 2020, in the streets of a relatively progressive city, Minneapolis. This brings home to us the work still to be done on issues of racial justice in America. And it's obviously not just that man, right? George Floyd called our attention to it. This is a, a protest that was in, in a piece of installation art, right? Uh, Say Their Names has become one of the, the, the calls to action. These are all African Americans who have been killed by the police. This happens uh, at roughly the frequency that lynching happened in the Jim Crow South. This is not an occasional occurrence. This is a regular thing in 21st century America. So in addition to that, the reason we're having our reckoning right now has to do with the fact that the coronavirus is having racially disproportionate effects. Uh, we can see this in cases per 10,000 people with Blacks and Latinos having much higher rates than whites. We can see this um, with uh, the progression of the disease. This is right three times the rate of white Americans. And as you can see, Blacks and Latinos have gone back and forth between who was worse affected. Um, but it's been since uh, April, two to three times the rate of contagion for people of color than it has been for white Americans. And we see this also in the death rates, right? Which is to say that although African Americans make up only 13% of the population, they account for nearly double that proportion of deaths. Um, and um, the, the racial data is incomplete, but what we can see is that it's highly disproportionate for African Americans. Now, why is this? And, and I, I think that several things account for this. One of them is that African Americans work in lines of work, as do Latino Americans, that it's impossible to do from home, that they have much less wealth than white Americans, and so they cannot just sit out of the labor market. And it's also the case that African Americans live in areas with higher density of population, with less developed public health infrastructure, poor hospitals, poor testing facilities now, and that African Americans have a higher incidence of underlying health conditions. And by the way, that reflects racial injustice. We'll get into this more, but many African Americans live in so-called food deserts, areas in the inner cities of the United States where it's extremely difficult to get access to healthy food. And so they are by necessity eating fast food, junk food, and that's contributing to high rates of diabetes. They live in areas with much poorer air quality. And the result is that they have higher rates of asthma. They live in housing projects that have infestations of rodents and uh, other pests. Uh, and we know that that also causes 
childhood asthma and does lifelong damage to the lungs, right? And, and, and so the susceptibility to the disease is a reflection of the inequality and injustice of our society. Um, and so that's a, a second reason that we're focusing on this. And of course, many of us recognize, as, as I imagine uh, you do, who, who is it that is actually doing the essential work in our society today? Whether that's the, the people who take care of us uh, in the communities we live in, who deliver our groceries and our other essential supplies, or work as nurses and orderlies in our hospitals, it is primarily people of color in those lines of work. And, and so we combine what the coronavirus is, is exposing about our society with what the video of George Floyd and other viral videos of racial injustice, particularly police violence display. And this is a moment of reckoning. Um, so underlying all of this, of course, is data about what happens with the police, right? And, and so black people are much more likely to be killed by the police, right? About three times more likely than white Americans. And that's despite the fact that actually African Americans are less likely to be armed than white Americans when they have an interaction with the police. Um, we'll say more about this, but uh, clearly there's a problem with the perception of threat and danger and the way in which implicit bias or racism leads police officers to fear African Americans more than they fear white Americans, despite the fact that if they were looking at the data, they would recognize that if, if having a weapon is a reason to be frightened of the person that you're interacting with or apprehending, they should be more frightened by white Americans. Um, now, having said this, policy matters, right? And so we can start by looking at um, the uh, comparison between Oklahoma and Georgia. And, and Georgia put in place statewide policies to combat implicit bias on the part of their police, to try to limit the number of lethal interactions between the police and civilian population, especially African Americans. And these policies have succeeded remarkably. Oklahoma, which demographically is very similar to Georgia, has not put those policies in place. And the result is that you're six times more likely to be killed in Oklahoma than in Georgia by the police if you're African American. Similarly, we can see this on the municipal level, cities that have put in place good policies uh, have uh, radically scaled back the number of African American deaths within the police. Cities that have not have much higher rates of fatality. Now, here are some of those solutions that work right, um, require officers to use other means before shooting, right, reduces police fatalities by 25%, require all use of force to be reported, reduces uh, fatalities um, by a similar amount. Ban chokeholds and strangleholds, there's a big movement to do that right now, reduces fatalities substantially have a so-called use of force continuum, which is to say you can't go straight for your gun or straight for your taser or straight for your billy club. You have to try talking and de-escalating first has a dramatic effect on the level of fatalities. Require de-escalation. That is to say, rather than the police escalating the confrontation, the police trying to understand that they produce stress, anxiety, fear in the people they are interacting with, they can help to bring that stress level down. <laughs> Sorry, and, and, and when they do that, they um, reduce the likelihood that there will be an escalating confrontation that may lead to a fatality by 
uh, have other officers have a duty to intervene if they think one of their peers is using excessive force, et cetera, right? So, so lots of measures that work, but those measures are not uniformly adopted, right? Buffalo, New York did this uh, under a court order. And uh, they now have had zero people killed by the police from 2013 to 2016. Orlando, Florida has not done it and they've killed 13 people in that same time period, right? And if you look, um, the demographics, the crime rates are very similar in Buffalo and Orlando. This is not comparing apples and oranges, this is apples and apples. Finally, and this I think is, is really critical to the outrage we're seeing in the streets today. When you look at the level of violence, right, the, the number of African Americans who've been killed by the police, you might say to yourself, well, at least there should be some accountability. But what you can see is that there really is no accountability. If we look at the number of African Americans killed by the police and ask, how many times have the officers who are involved been uh, charged, right? Four times out of 100. How many times have they been convicted? One time out of 100. And so in a sense, there's almost immunity from accountability on the police force um, for these incidents. It's, it's one thing to, to say, some of them are complicated. Not every one of them is necessarily a crime, but it's another thing to confront a diagram like this and say, is it really the case that 96% of these killings are justified and don't deserve at least a criminal investigation? That strains credibility. Um, I think um, I'll, I'll just give you a little bit more data. When we talk about the, the problem of racial injustice in the American criminal justice system, the tip of the iceberg, the, 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 the most visible and salient issue is the use of deadly force, right? The killing of African Americans, especially African American men by the police. But that is not the totality of the problem. Every bit as much a problem is the epidemic of mass incarceration in the United States. And, and, and this diagram, I think, brings it out so clearly that from 1950 to the late 1970s, the United States had roughly 200,000 people in prison at any one time. Today, we have over one and a half million people. We lead the world in per capita incarceration. And of course, this is racially disproportionate. African Americans are much more likely to be incarcerated than our white Americans. Uh, and as you can see, um, there are clear racial disparities in the criminal justice system in the United States. African Americans are much likelier to do much longer times for committing the same crime. The most recent data says they do about 20% more time for the same crime. That's part of the reason so many more of them are in jail. Um, and they're much more likely to be convicted, seven times more likely to be convicted for murder, three and a half times for sexual assault, 12 times more likely for drug crimes. That represents the fact that prosecutors go much harder at African Americans than white Americans. That white Americans typically have greater wealth and so can afford great, better legal counsel and that juries are biased, right? And, and, and so all of this then indicates that we have a systematic problem in our criminal justice system in the United States. That's what the protests are about. All right, so I'm going to stop there in order to leave time for questions. Who wants to, to start out? And, and I promise next week I will get into issues to do with wealth.
and right. employment and health, other dimensions of inequality. But I wanted to focus on criminal justice today because that's the immediate catalyst for the protests in the country right now. Who wants to start us out with a, a, a question or a comment? Go ahead, please. Yes. Uh, I see if you agree with me. I, I kind of feel that uh, I should say that this is uh, you are born with the feeling of hatred for blacks. I, I think I got talking about the uh, policemen. However, although if you can't be born with it, uh, hatred, uh, that kind of hatred, I don't believe is inherited. However, when you're very, very young, you do get it and learn that so much crime is caused by black Americans. And so with some policemen, they grow up, uh, they become police women with this innate hatred. And you can see this by both of these, uh, what they did, uh, shooting the person seven times in the back unnecessary, uh, keeping a knee on for seven minutes or whatever. So my question is, some policemen have an innate hatred for blacks. Would you agree with that? So um, thank you for the comment. And, and let me say, I think you're absolutely right, that, that, that Derek Chauvin, who was the police officer who put his knees on George Floyd's neck and, and choked the life out of him, uh, by all accounts was a racist man. And, and, and racist in the old fashioned sense. Um, he liked lording power over African-Americans. He thought of African-Americans as primarily <laughs> criminal, not good people. At least, you know, I, I don't know him. I haven't interviewed him. I'm relying on what I read in the press, but what his own peers say about him is that he was that kind of man. But, well, uh, this is but, intense hatred. That's all I'm saying. But, but I want to be clear, that's probably an exceptional case. And, 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 and so when, when you hear the rhetoric about this, sometimes hear about um, bad apples, right? There are a few bad apples in the police force. There are a few people who we put guns on their hips and uh, give the authority to do the work of policing. Um, I'm getting a little background noise. I'm, I'm going to mute just for a moment. You can unmute yourself, but that, that way we'll have a, a quieter uh, background. Um, that, that there are a few police officers like him in many police forces. But let me tell you a, a, a personal story here for a moment. Um, and, and I'm going to talk about my family dog, right? My, my, my family dog was a racist. Uh, and, and so German Shepherd. Um, I don't think of myself as a racist. I don't think of my parents as racist. My father worked with the NAACP as a volunteer lawyer in the 1960s. Uh, my mother uh, sent me to school in Oakland, California, where I was the racial minority because she was convinced that that was the just thing to do. But our dog was picking up on something in us, right? And that is to say that even though we were racial liberals, probably at an unconscious level, we were not as comfortable with black people as we were with white people. White people were our family, were our friends, were the people we had the greatest comfort with. And maybe we had a little bit of implicit fear of African Americans and the dog, was trained to pick up on that, right? That's why we breed, it was a German shepherd. And, and so in a sense, they're bred for that. Um, and, and so that gets at something that's deeper, right? We were not hateful racists. We would never put our knees on the neck of a black man or anything like it. But maybe at some level, even though we weren't filled with hate, even though we believed in equality and justice, we nevertheless had some implicit attitudes that affected us. And I'll give you more example as we get further into this course, but for a lot of these police officers, they're not killing African Americans because they hate them, because they were socialized from a young age by their parents to hate them. 
they are reacting out of fear because our society teaches all of us to fear African Americans. That's what we see on the news every night. By the way, it's inaccurate as a reflection of the demographics of crime and the rates of crime in our country. It's what we see in the movies. It's what we see on TV. It's in the air in our country. And so many people who are African American themselves and police officers end up bringing racial violence to bear on African Americans. This is not only a problem to do with hateful white racism. This is a problem to do with systemic social attitudes and implicit bias as opposed to explicit hateful racism. So I, I, I am in a sense uh, agreeing with you for the bad apple, but disagreeing with you for the totality of the picture, it's more complex than just some people having been socialized to be hateful from a young age. Make sense? Uh, let me, sorry, unmute everybody. You're, you're unmuted, you can talk again now. Uh, hopefully we don't get too much background noise. Making, making sense? Yeah, okay. Um, I think the problem, Socially, you can't change people. You could change a certain segment of the population, but a lot of it depends on the education of the police force. Uh, you can't even change their feelings, how, racial, how, how they feel about the races, but they have to know what they can do and what they cannot do. And that's all there is to it. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, you're anticipating where we will go, which is if we want to fix this, what can we do, right? And, <laughs> and I will get into that. But, but I think you're absolutely right that if all we do is try to change attitudes, we're, we're, we're uh, really going to face an uphill battle. We have to change social structure. And, and so one of the big things we'll talk about is segregation. Our society today is as segregated as it was in 1950, right? Um, and, and so for many of us, um, we don't have sustained encounters with people of another race, right? And, and that is, I think, absolutely integral to the problem. So, so maybe as opposed to just changing attitudes, we have to change structures structures that give rise to the uh, attitudes, reinforce the attitudes, and if we can change the structures, maybe the attitudes will start to change as well. Hopefully. Yes, that's, the, well, we, we've got to try. We are collectively responsible. For Absolutely. This. Okay, thank and, you so much. Oh, well, thank you. Anybody else with the, with the final question or comment today? <laughs> All right, everybody, take care of yourselves. Uh, and like I say, this will be a series. We'll, we'll come back to these questions over the next few weeks. Take care, be safe and smart. Yeah. Good spending time with you again today. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah. Bye.